Hi, this is author and musician Sid Griffin da -da -da -da, with John Broughton on Retrospectives on KC Radio 97.7 FM. As a child for you, what, what triggered this uh, love affair with music? Uh, I think seeing, seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show was a big deal. For, yeah. any, for any American kid, it was a, a nationally uh, broadcast show and, and everybody was on it. Absolutely everybody was on it. And uh, the, 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 the Beatles were on it in February 64 and I think the country's population was something like 200 and 20 million and 86 million Americans saw it or 84 million Americans saw it. I mean, it was just incredible. We didn't get those kind of TV audiences back then. Yeah. So it was just, I mean, the next day, everybody was talking about it. I don't just mean kids either. I mean, at parents and, you know, policemen on the street and school teachers and guys in factories, everyone was talking about it. So did you become, I guess, fanatical about music straight away? Were you immediately started, just started soaking up as much information as you could? I'd already been listening to and had an older sister and heard things like the Beach Boys and all all that, John. So it wasn't alien the idea of music and records and all that stuff. But I would have been nine or ten when the nine when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, and uh, so it wasn't an alien thing to be getting into music. And yeah. uh, I didn't get a guitar till later, but but I certainly went nuts for that kind of rock and roll. But to be more specific, what about your well-known love for the music of the birds and all its various offshoots? When when did that start to, to come into play? Around 1975, when I uh, hated the music of the day so bad, I started exploring um, jazz like Charlie Parker and stuff like that and, and, and country artists from the 50s and the late 40s. And I realized that uh, I was going back and buying... The, the, the entire catalogs of all these, you know, in America there's so many used record stores you could get, even 25, 30 years ago, you'd get LPs for just a couple of bucks if they were a little scratched up. And I would go and hunt down, I'd have all four Love and Spoonful LPs, and I'd go get the, the Jefferson Airplane LP. And I, and I realized going back to, of all of them, I thought the birds were the best back catalog. I, I, the first six albums, anyway. Mm. Then it starts getting really patchy, but the first six pre flight through Sweetheart of the Rodeo are just terrific records and that's what kicked that off it was 1975 the first one I bought was Turn 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 up till then I'd only had a copy of Greatest Hits but then I realized hey you know almost every album these guys did was good so that immediately vaulted them into the Beatles sort of Stones you know pantheon tell us about some of your early your early bands and how it all eventually evolved into what became the Long Riders well I had a band in the, in, as a, you know, like a 10 or 11 year old, but it was just guys goofing around, and we actually played in backyard, back gardens, as they'd say in England. And then the next real thing we had was we had a band in 69, 70, when everybody, you know, just, you had bands in the late 60s, everybody did, and, uh, we, uh, had a band around 69, 70 that rehearsed obsessively and hardly ever played. And the first time we had a, a thousand different names, which is why I haven't given you a single one. But but <laughs> I remember once we played a gig, and the, the, we were doing "Love the One You You're With," and I, because I was too old to be in the the, the 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 part of the bar that the music was in, we plugged the longest guitar lead we could find into a fuzz box. We took the second longest guitar lead we could find, took it out of the fuzz box, put it in my guitar. So the band was on stage about 25 feet away <laughs> and I was sitting on a sofa in the next room with, with a door between us so I was actually sitting on this sofa looking at people in a coat check room while the band was playing on stage you know 25, 30 feet away or whatever it was and that must have looked pretty funny but I was playing the songs I just wasn't singing yeah. because I couldn't be in the bar I was like 15 or 14 or whatever so um and from there I went to school went to college and uh played in some horrible bands in college and then uh I saw a picture of the Sex Pistols, just a photograph. I had not, I'd heard of them, but I'd never heard a song, I'd never seen a picture. And a guy named Greg Shaw, who's just died about three months ago, who's a friend of mine. At the time, I didn't know Greg Shaw, but he wrote an article reviewing the Sex Pistols live at the 100 Club. And he said they were young, they played bad originals, and they played pretty enthusiastic, but 
ultimately uh, un, you know, dignified, unqualified, unaccomplished versions of hits by the Who and the Small Faces and 60s bands. And there was a picture of the Sex Pistols on stage at the 100 Club. And I looked at the picture and I thought, those guys are my age. They don't look as good as I look. And they sound like I could be in their band easily. That you know, I mean, I play as well or better than that. And that was a real inspiration, just that article. And I don't think I ever told Greg that before he died, which was a great loss. Yeah. I wish I had told him that before he died. We were in email contact, and I, he came to London. I visited him. He visited with me when he came over several times. But all those years in California, I never told him what I was doing there or how I was specific, specifically inspired. I'm looking at my daughter. <laughs> and I was specifically inspired by that article. And it's funny. I drove across the country by myself with... Uh, all the stuff loaded in my car, my guitars and some clothes to go to California, quote unquote, make it. And when I got to the Pasadena, which is the northeast corner of L.A. proper, the, you know, a city northeast of L.A., but part of metropolitan L.A., John, I, I pulled in to get something to eat. I was really nervous because I only knew one person in the whole metropolitan area. And I pulled in to get something to eat at this fast food Mexican restaurant. And I got my order. And I, I was so nervous about Californians. I ate, I took it to my car to eat it in my car in the parking lot rather than eat it in this horrible <laughs> fast food restaurant. And when I turned on the radio, I, I put it on the far left and I dialed to the right. When America... On all the good stations are probably far left or far right. In the middle is, is Clear Channel, and you're just, you know, all these stations and classic baby boomer rock and roll stations and stuff like that. But on the far left are your college stations that play, you know, groovy underground things. And on the far right are your fringe commercial stations. So I put it on the far left, and dialing to the right, I, it was exactly what I thought. It was Jackson Brown, Led Zeppelin, then some station would play Jackson Brownish music, be it Joni Mitchell or James Taylor, and the next station would play either Led Zeppelin or Led Zeppelin's Sons and Daughters. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like heart. Yeah. So I finally got to the right, and the very, very last station was K-Rock, K-R-O-Q, which was a famous underground state, very, very underground then. The ratings were terrible. And when I got to it, a now relatively famous man on the now K-Rock more famous station called Rodney Bingenheimer. I had no idea who he was. This, this asthmatic voice, because this man's had a stroke and he's still a DJ. This asthmatic voice goes, I've just gotten to L.A., remember? This asthmatic voice goes, okay, now we're going to play all three Sex Pistol singles, A-sides and B-sides in a row, and six <laughs> songs in a row, okay? Okay. So everybody get their tape recorders ready, because, you know, it's hard to find the records in America. They weren't on yeah. an American label. So I thought, my God, this is it. I've gone to L.A. inspired by an article and a photograph about this band, and I pull into a restaurant, and here they are. So I sat there eating this burrito, which was swiftly growing cold, and listening to the Sex Pistols. And I heard um, Anarchy in the U.K., and I can't remember what the flip side was, Satellite or I Want to Be Me or whatever. And then I heard uh, God Save the Queen, and it's flip side. And then the third one would be, I think, Holidays in the Sun with No Fun is a flip side, something like that. Yeah. And... Um, I was just astonished. I just sat there. I can't believe it. I mean, this incredible Sex Pistols music came out, which sounded so revolutionary then. Of course, it doesn't now. I mean, they just sound like a good, you know, guitar band now. But at the time, they did sound incredible. I mean, you just couldn't believe it. Mm. That's a great story. And, and that's that's how. That's it. I, I and I could. I, I never told Greg Shaw this. Not that I remember telling him. And it was a big. Who? I mean, who thought Greg would die? Hell, you know, he was only fifty-four or something. Uh. Did you um the real hero? Did, did you have a pretty clear blueprint of the sound that you wanted for the Long Riders? Was, was there a definite no. game plan there? No, I was in a punk band. I I was in L.A. and had, we had a proper punk band called Death Wish, who were awful, so awful that I've never bothered to keep up with any of the guys. Um, one of the guys I see every once in a blue moon because I know where he works, and the other ones, they, Death Wish was such a horrible experience. You know, I, I, I I didn't want. I mean, I loved punk music like the Pistols and the Clash and and all the other bands of the era, but I didn't. I didn't really want to play it. I wasn't, frankly, that angry about anything. I'd had a comfortable existence, and I wasn't living in a tower block in West London. Um, I'm not living in one now, and uh, so although I liked punk music, I, I loved um, the Saints. I loved that first album. I loved the first two, and I loved I'm Stranded. But I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was, I wasn't angry. I couldn't even play I'm Stranded. I mean, you know, I just, I could play it, but I wouldn't want to play that 
you know, just, you know, Ramones, I, I, I got the first Ramones album probably the month it came out only because the black and white cover looked cool. <laughs> I mean, just, it, and in fact, the first time I was in L.A. before I went there and told you that story I just told you, I was there a year earlier just to check it out to see if I'd like it. I had one more year to go in school. And we spent about a month kicking around out there and I saw the, the Ramones in August 1976 and that was mind-blowing to see them that early. Mind-blowing. And, uh, I've gotten completely off the subject and have no idea where I was going with this. <laughs> That's okay, not a my, problem. My daughter's been very ill, so she's distracting me. I, I, we've not had a good night. She had 103 fever, but oh, she's God. playing peacefully now, so we're, we're okay. Oh, let me know if you have to stop for any reason. That's fine. I'm really, really zonked because I didn't get any sleep. Well, not much sleep. But anyway, carry on. Uh, you had a wonderful question. I got so far off the subject. That's okay. Back. Not, to, not to worry. I, I read you quoted somewhere as saying that if you'd been, correct me if, if you didn't say this, if you'd been a few years older or a few years younger, the long riders may have made it big. Do you, do you really feel you're a victim of unfortunate timing there? Absolutely. Um, I do feel that. Uh, a friend of mine, a rock critic over here named Johnny Black, said the Long Riders were the perfectly right band at the perfectly wrong time. And he's right. I mean, we were too late to be in with, um, certainly too late to be in, too young to be in with the Eagles and the Flying Burrito Brothers and Hearts and Flowers and uh, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and New Riders of the Purple Sage. Well, we know that. We missed that boat by um, about six or seven years. And if we'd have been, say, four to six, six years uh, younger than that, which we weren't, we, we, could have, we could have been in with Wilco, or rather Uncle Tupelo, mm. and um, the No Depression uh, Americana movement. But the Long Riders were perfectly between the two points of Flying Burrito Brothers, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Eagles, New Riders of the Purple Sage, and uh, Uncle Tupelo, and the whole Sunvolt, you know, uh, uh, Wilco kind of thing. And... I guess what would have happened, we shouldn't have broken up because we'd be, we'd be more or less, I feel, the Jayhawks. The Jayhawks were an opening act for the Long Riders. Um, the Jayhawks started, I guess, about when we started or maybe the year or two after we started. But the thing is, two of them have never given it up. And there's two guys from the original band, and, and here they are now doing, you know, not terrifically well because there's no real market commercial marketplace for Americana or alt country, but nonetheless, they sell a few hundred thousand, what, 200,000 units worldwide or something, and that's what the long riders would be doing if we'd have kept going. But like idiots, we broke up. So but there you go. Do you look at that movement today and take a bit of pride, though, in the fact that you probably do deserve to be recognized as, as pioneers of that? Yes, I do, and the only thing that bothers me is, is, when, is when we're not. I mean, we were a real link in the chain. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to make the jump from the Graham Parsons era bands, be it the Clarence White Birds or Nitty Gritty Dirt Band or, or New Riders or Eagles, to uh, the modern era's alt country bands without the Long Riders and Jason and the Scorchers and to a slightly less degree, Green on Red, without those kind of bands interpreting that music. Um, you just, you know, you, you can't make that connection. In other, in other words, when we went to St. Louis, what became Uncle Tupelo was a bunch of black flag worshipping record store kids that saw the Long Riders and thought, hmm, maybe we should tone down the black flag hero worship, which I love black flag. I'm not, I'm not putting Greg Ginn or, or Chuck uh, Dukowski down at all. I'm just saying that maybe these guys thought maybe we should tone down the black flagisms and and do something more like the Long Riders. Um, when the Long Riders, here's another example. When the Long Riders toured, our opening band was frequently in the South, in particular, a Georgia band uh, out of Atlanta and Athens called Mr. Crow's Garden. Years later, they became the Black Crows, with Chris and Rich Robinson growing their hair long. They were an REM kind of band, like. Um, and we said to them, you know, you guys, with all respect, Mr. Crow's Garden is a good band, but you, you sound like R.E.M. imitators, which is really what you're doing. And, and they, they said, hmm. And so a couple of years later, this guy came to them with this battle plan for, look, grow your hair, because I see a gap in the marketplace. And Chris and Rich did, and they became the Black Crows. So there's a third example, and I'm so tired I forgot it. But, um, <laughs> you know, we really did. We really did complete this link in the chain and yeah. uh, I, the only thing that bugs me is when there's a piece in a magazine or a CD or a book comes out and it doesn't say that 
That's usually, oddly, oddly in America, in Europe, they give us this credit. What album for you did, did The Long Riders really hit its straps and, and, and peak to the band that you, you wanted it to be? Which album? Yeah, which album did it for you? Uh, I, 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 we made three albums and two EPs and a bunch of various singles on compilations and B-side things. And I, I don't think any of our records are perfect, and I don't think any of our records are uh, terrible. Uh, you know, I think uh, of the three albums we made, the three formal albums we made, I actually like Two Fisted Tales, which is the last one, mm -hmm. which uh, got overlooked a bit, even though it got killer reviews. It, got, it didn't sell as well as the first two, but it got terrific reviews. And uh, that's a favorite of mine. I feel it has one song that's not the scratch, and I won't tell you what song it is. But um, I don't have any real complaints. I mean, you know, I, uh, every album we made has a couple of dumb, stupid songs that shouldn't be on it. We, we had this reunion over here last year for the first time in 17 years. Not only did we play, but the first time in 17 years I spoke to the bass player. I hadn't, you know, I'd sent him a postcard and... You know, we'd done some business by the post, but I hadn't seen or spoken to Tom Stevens since the day he left the band. Wow. Um, till he, till I met him at the train station last summer. So, my my point was, and I forgot my point again. I'm so tired. I forgot what I was going to say. God, I'm so tired. I'm so sorry, John. <laughs> That's all right. No worries. You're based in England now. What sort of... Um... Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. This is what I was going to yeah, say. <laughs> I was going to say, um, when we got together to rehearse, before we even rehearsed, we, we knocked together, what songs do you want to do? And everyone sat down to, to minimize uh, rehearsal time in London for the European dates. Everyone decided, look, um, let's decide on the set list now, and you have like three months to learn it before we show up. That way everyone can practice at home to the records. And it worked out really well to do that. And what I was going to say is, is after 17 years, it's obvious which songs hold up and which ones don't. I mean, some songs, even the title, just you just know this isn't going to work. It's too adolescent. Yeah. We, we had a song called Join My Gang, which I wrote, which I thought was kind of, you know, who you know, power pop and groovy. And I actually had Steve McCarthy sing the lines, you don't smash street lights, you don't have brick fights or something. It was just, well, you know, I was, I've never smashed a street light or been in a brick fight in the streets in my life either. So I don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and so it's just obvious sometimes after 17 years what songs hold up and what don't. And they're good songs on, on every album. And there's a couple of clunkers on every album, but yeah. I don't care. Anyway, now go. You're you're in England now. Uh, what what sort of following did the Long Riders enjoy over there before you made that move? Was it stronger than than back home in the states? Um. Well, in America, our strong we had a number one uh, alternative album in America, and we never got past number two in the UK because the Smiths were in the way. Mm -hmm. So, um, I I guess nationally across the board, the UK. Actually, Spain was our best territory in the world. Spain was. But in English-speaking lands, I guess the U.K. was in a way. But the thing is, America's so big. For instance, in, in Chicago, we could draw 2,000 people and sell out a venue. Now, in, we, drive, we drive four hours to Milwaukee and literally draw 75 people. And the difference was Milwaukee didn't play us on the radio. So it's hard for me to answer which country did you do better in. Yeah. We, we in America, you know, in New York, Chicago, several towns down south, uh, San Francisco, we were incredible. We drew huge crowds. And then um, in other American cities, we didn't draw as well. So it's hard to say. In all British cities, we could draw 500 to 1,000 people, all of them. But I don't think any British city other than London could we draw over 2,000 people. Whereas we drew 2,000 people several times in several different American cities, which is a miracle back then. Because you have to remember, going back to your earlier question, the infrastructure wasn't there for the Long Riders or for Jason and the Scorchers or for Green on Red or for hardly any of this, frankly. It was a weird transitional phase between the, the good punk bands like, frankly, Black Flag and the Clash and people were, the Clash were falling apart and Black Flag's adapting, but, you know, it was a weird transitional phase. I mean, you know, you had a lot of popular bands like Men at Work and, and Asia, and it was just a weird transitional phase. I mean, when we came to England, one reason we did well, and the ultimate reason why we couldn't do any better, is they're all listening to sort of Kaga Juju and, uh, 
Lamal and uh, We're the Kids in America, mm. and Haircut 100, <laughs> and, and Human League, and uh, I mean, it's just, you know, hopeless, you know, soft sell, hopeless. You know, we didn't have synthesizers or look like idiots, and, yeah. and so we immediately got a, an audience in England for that right off the bat, but then again, you're going to hit a glass ceiling because no one's going to play you on the radio because they're playing all these sissy synth-pop bands, who I still hate to this day. <laughs> You're not alone there. Then I don't like them now. <laughs> You're not alone there. Uh, move on to Cole Porter's. How did all that come together? Well, when the Long Riders broke up, I sort of thought the Long Riders were going to be a big, big deal. I, I, I didn't see that. You know, there was nowhere to go. And I even had people in the industry tell me this. We even had a guy at Island Records, rather cruelly, if honestly, tell us that you can only take this about as far as you can take it. This is a guy doing our publicity. <laughs> a guy named Shulman. And this guy actually said that. And we were like, what do you mean? We're supposed to be going around town doing interviews with you. And he says, well, we will, but you guys got to think you've done, well, you've gone a lot farther than you thought you'd ever go. And I said, no, 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 we're going to be like the Clash or whatever. And, and he said, well, how? Who's going to play you on the radio? And I felt like saying, well, what are we doing driving around going to do interviews? You're supposed to be, you know. But ultimately, as cruel as that was to hear, he was right. Mm. There was nowhere to go. People weren't going to play this kind of uh, stuff on the radio. The Long Riders template was, let's see what happens if the Birds or the Buffalo Springfield had the Clash or the Sex Pistols rhythm section. That's what it was. And where are you going to go with that on radio? If you don't get on radio, you're dead. Mm. So the Cole Porters, how did all that um, evolve? Well, the Long Riders broke up, and for about two years, because I had some money from the band, for two years, I didn't really do much of anything. I mean, I didn't form a band. I didn't play my guitar much. I didn't. I didn't uh, write a novel or a screenplay. I, I was really depressed, and I basically hung out in my uh, pad. With my, we, I had a home with the Bangles, uh, a house, and various roadies, and Billy Bremner of Rockpile, the Bangles, and Eric Burden from the Animals. All these people lived in this big rock and roll house, right? And um, I basically just sort of hung out there and entertained myself hanging out with people like that. And I played basketball, and I just, after about two years, I thought, well, I'm running out of money. I've got to do something. So I formed the Coal Porters, and uh, I should have probably formed a band immediately after the Long Riders and, uh, you know, carried on from the good, good will and good name that I had at the time. But like an idiot, I didn't. So um, you really want, I got to just tell you, it was tough going to get the Cole Porter started. It was mm. really tough. And also, I, I, I made a mistake. I didn't really have a template for the Cole Porters. The, the Long Riders thing was, you know, as I said, what happens if you took a punk rhythm section like Cook and um, Matlock or um, Paul Simon and, and uh, uh, Topper Hidden? You know, what happens if you took that rhythm section and put it underneath Richie Fure, Neil Young, Stephen Stills, and the Springfield? Well, that I should have done a template like that for the uh, the coal porters, and I didn't. So we just sort of didn't have enough of a direction. We were a wonderful, wonderful sort of uh, Creedence Clearwater kind of band, I thought, but it just didn't work out. Mm. And in more recent times, it's evolved into a more rootsier type of effort, very much almost, uh, you know. Yeah, here's what happened. I mean, I, it's funny. I just, you know, everyone's transferring their old videos to DVD. So someone sent me, uh, I, I, my old friends in L.A. have sent me um, about four videos or DVDs of the Cole Porters playing <coughs> in L.A. in 91, 92 and all that. And frankly, it's pretty good music. It's a little kind of old-fashioned, I guess, you know. But I think what's wrong with it, looking at the early electric coal porters, is we don't really look like a band. I mean, the Long Riders looked like a band. I, I, that was my thing. I told the guys, if we want to succeed, we have to be like the early birds or the Ramones. It helps to have a look. And everybody in the band should look like they're in the same band. If you get the very first Pretenders album cover, it's like four different people. It's amazing that band succeeded. I mean, obviously they succeeded because Chrissy Hine was hot stuff. You know, she wrote good songs. She was a provocative figure. She sang well. But you've got one guy in the album cover, the Pretenders, looking like he's in a motorcycle gang. One guy's dressed like a university professor in a suit and tie. And uh, Chrissy Hine's wearing this red leather jacket. And I can't... Oh, then James Honeyman Scott... 
the late James Honeyman Scott's dressed like this new wave guitar geek with, you know, aviator shades and all that. And, and I said, that's what you shouldn't do. You know, we want to be like the Ramones or uh, the early birds or the rubber sole Beatles or whatever. You know, where you look like four guys that sort of look like each other, have mm. the same, ha same haircut. And the Cole Porter should have done that. Every band should do that. And so after playing this electric music and not knowing why it wasn't happening, I mean, the Cole Porters could draw 300 people anywhere in the U.K. and Europe, but it's just that, you know, it wasn't happening. That's not really enough. So I finally said, I'm going to do something else. And I did this band, Western Electric, right? And it, we had a great album out in 2000. Mojo hailed it. I thought, oh, I've, you know, I got this modern port. You know, I did a template. I said, we're, we're Portishead playing Wilco, right? What if Wilco used Portishead technology to record the next album? That's what I told the band. So we made this great record called Western Electric by the band Western Electric. Our drummer has an automobile accident and almost dies, and I make this promise that you know we won't have the band without him well he's still two two or three years late two and a half years later he's still in physiotherapy wow. so the cold porters are stumbling along and i produced i know this is a long story but i produced this album for lindisfarne and I, I thought i was a member of a band called western electric but when i produced this album for lindisfarne they had a lot of acoustic instruments lying around and at the end of the sessions they bought me a mandolin because they'd seen me fooling around with the mandolin so while we were waiting for the Western Electric drummer to heal, we took the Cole Porter's name and started gigging as a like a bluegrass band, and it was sort of like the first Dillard and Clark album. Yep. And uh, it's done really well. I don't, what can I tell you? <laughs> I mean, I, we don't have a drummer. We don't have electric instruments. Four part harmonies, and I mean harmonies, and it's really done well. That's uh, all come out of pure chance, really. Yeah, because. You know, I thought, well, you know, I'll play electric music with drum beats and samples, but, you know, really funny stuff. It wasn't like, you know, dance hall stuff. It was intelligent thinking man's pop. And I got these great reviews, and then Western Electric just fell apart before my eyes. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. We lost this drummer. He was the drummer in Primal Scream that quit to join me. He was on their first few records named Dave Morgan. Okay. And we're still waiting for Dave Morgan to kind of to come back to 100%. And so we formed this bluegrass band. I'm very, very, very pleased the way things are going. Reading through... If you know, if you know the first Dillard and Clark record, that's what we kind of do. Yeah, I do. Yep. That's it. Scanning through, through some other articles and interviews with you, I, I gained the impression that the solo album you did a few years back, Little Victories, is a, is a proud moment for you and a significant point in your career. Yeah, what happened was... Uh, People offer me solo troubadour gigs, and I'm not really that great a solo troubadour, and uh, I'm more of a band person, but I thought, well, if I'm going to go out and do it, I should have something to, to promote. So I just finished the second Sid Griffin solo troubadour record, and uh, I'm really proud of it. It'll be, I hope, late or maybe summer 2005. And it's just, you know, I, get, I just went to Italy and did some solo stuff because I got offered the job, but I must say, John, I'm not... I'm not trying to be a Woody Guthrie figure, <laughs> nor do I feel it's my strong suit. Yeah. But I, it, it's you know I've opened tours for people like Roger McGuinn, and I, and I you know I've gone all around. Well, I haven't been to South America or Africa with it, but I've been most other places. Yeah, well, it's certainly a low cost way of getting your music on the road, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a lot of fun. But ultimately, a three week solo tour, you just go batty. You know, I don't see how people do it. I mean, there's literally guys that go out, like my friend Peter Case. Yep. He was in a band called the Plimsolls. He's not a solo troubadour singer-songwriter. He literally will go out for, say, 10 days or three weeks all by himself with nobody. You know, he's gone out with a girlfriend. He's gone out with a friend friend. But he just usually goes out with Peter Case. And I would just go nuts. I like the camaraderie of guys, or we have a woman in the cold pores, but I like the camaraderie of friends in a van or a bus, depending on the level of your success, barreling down the highway. I like that. I like the uh, the atmosphere. I like the uh, esprit de corps. I like the camaraderie, as I said. I mean, I think some of the best, of the 100 best conversations I've ever had in my life, I'm sure 90 of them have been in a vehicle either going to or coming from a concert that I've performed in or am about to perform in. You can't, you can't get that touring solo. No, you really, yeah, you really learn about people and, you know, and, and you really exchange and open up and, and you find out what people can do and can't do. It's like managing a, uh, you know, if you're like, uh, I don't know, some rules football team, like maybe, uh, isn't there one called Geelong? 
Yes. <laughs> Very good. But you manage Geelong, and uh, you learn that certain players, and Aussie rules football can do this, and certain players can do that. And you learn, you, you, you play to the strength of the team. And, and that's, that's how I really like things. You, you know, you, you do what the strength of the team is. And when it's me on my own, there's never that moment where you can sort of step back and, and let somebody else take it. Yeah. It's always you, and I find that difficult. You're involved in so many projects with your music, uh, your writing, yeah. your research work. Have you become uh, pretty good at uh, time management? Yeah, not bad. I mean, uh, the last year, maybe 15 months, has been a little rough in that the downloads have hurt the record industry so much that the kind of reissues I do have tapered off. I haven't been that busy. Um, I did for Raven Records a Gene Clark Birds reissue down under, mm -hmm. and for Sundays in uh, New York uh, State, I did a reissue of Safe at Home by the International Submarine Band. But I used to really be busy starting around, I don't know when, vinyl. So just about a year and a half, 15 months, a year ago, and it's really been it was pretty slow in 2004. I bet I only did uh, five or six reissues the whole year. And usually I might be doing 15, 18, mm -hmm. but there you go. Sign of the times, isn't it? Yeah, it's sad. It's a real, real sad moment for me in the record industry. You know, the singles industry is dying in the UK. It's almost gone. And, you know, it's just, it's sad. I, I, I think kids are missing the, I know they're saving money by downloading the song for 79 pence instead of buying the CD single for 39, for 3.99 and, and getting some tracks they may not want. But it's sad that people don't want to have the artwork anymore and don't want to know who played saxophone on track three. Exactly. There's always a lot of fun record collecting when yeah. you saw that this guy was on track three and he also played on a Van Morrison record or whatever. Does it concern you at all that you may be become more recognized for your writing contributions to the various publications and that than for your music, considering you are a musician no, first and foremost? Care. Doesn't doesn't worry you? My main thing is I'm avoiding a day job. I do not want to work in an office. That's a big thing with me. I, uh, I want to have a fun, enjoyable life, and I'd rather do what I do and make less money than make more money and work in some soul-destroying office situation. That's yeah. a major part of my life. I, I like traveling the world. I like my friends. I like music. I like doing reissues. I don't really have a problem with it. A, a massive project you were involved with recently was, of course, the, the Grand Parsons documentary. Now, you're, you're considered an expert on all things Parsons. But did you still manage to, to learn things about him that, that you didn't know? Yeah, it's interesting because if you really get into somebody... I think all of us have interesting lives. I mean, some obviously more so than others. But I think if you really get into a guy, I mean, finally, after a while, you know, we met all these people that Graham went to elementary school with and went to high school with and um, uh, went to Harvard with. And after a while, you realize that you, you, you stop thinking, or I stopped thinking of Graham Parsons as a musician of the birds or whatever, and just started thinking of him as a guy. It was a really interesting life story. And, uh, as I said towards the end of the filming, I told the, the director, I said, even if Graham had not been a musician, if he'd never joined the Birds, if he'd never been a Brito brother, if he'd never met Amy Lou Harris, even if Graham had never been a musician, it's a hell of a life. I mean, uh, mm. it really is a Tennessee Williams play, as Chris Hillman and so many people keep telling us in the film. I mean, it really is. I mean, his family comes from money. They uh, they sort of drink the money away in bad and bad business investments and. It's just incredible what all went down. It's just incredible. And, you know, Graham, his dad blows his brain out in the woods. It's just terrible. And then his mother drinks herself to death. And they put his sister, his 100% his, his blood sister, in a, in a mental institution. I mean, it was just an incredible story. You, as this cliche goes, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> and then you throw in the birds and the burritos and Amy Lou, and it's like, oh, wow, it's really great. But, I mean, God, what a story. Mm. I mean, it's a miracle he lasted as long as he did because, uh, you know, he had a shit life. There's a new Mojo magazine out. I write for Mojo, as you know. And there's a wonderful article by a guy named Pat Gilbert, and it's on Sid Vicious. And it's just, it just another one of those guys that had a terrible, terrible home life where he wasn't loved. Now, Sid Vicious was English and had an impoverished background with a junkie mother. 
uh, but Grant, and a father who abandoned him. But Graham Parsons had a wealthy background in America, but had a dad who abandoned him by suicide, and a mother who drank herself to death. So, you know, I mean, what's the difference? I mean, if you look at your rock stars, one thing I've learned is Johnny Thunders, the dad abandoned the family. Um, Brian Jones wasn't particularly loved by his fa parents, didn't have a warm home life. Hendrix, all these people that did a lot of drugs, you know, I think Crosby, almost every single one of them had something wrong with their home life. Bad, bad parenting, really. Uh, Janis Joplin, there was a wonderful BBC documentary on Janis Joplin. God, her mother just was a nightmare, Mrs. Joplin. So, I mean, you know, and that's the kind of thing I learned about Graham. I mean, forget the music, just the human being. I mean, one of the great things I learned about the Graham Parsons story is love your children, <laughs> or you will, you know, grow up, they will grow up to be nightmares for everybody. I mean, Graham was a handsome, talented nightmare, but he was a nightmare. Yeah. As a musician, though, did, did working on that project alter your view on him as a musician? To be honest with you, I've overrated him. You think so? Yeah, I, I have to. I have. I, I overrated him, and he. Uh, I mean, let's face it. Other people are doing this country rock thing as well. I mean, the early Elvis Presley singles on Sun, and certainly the Love and Spoonfuls, uh, first two or three records. They were doing a uh, sort of a country rock feel as we know it now. Beatles, Rubber Soul. You know, I don't want to spoil the party before I'll go, whatever album that's on. There's a lot of people doing it, and Graham gets the credit, but what Graham really did, and I've said it a thousand times, is he was the first guy to play country music with a hippie, long hair, marijuana, chip on his shoulder attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, no one had played straight country music or any kind of country music with that kind of 60s long hair, I've smoked marijuana attitude. And Graham was the first. I really think he was the first. But actually, as a as a musical pioneer, combining straight country and rock, there's a, a half dozen other people. Michael Nesmith in the first national band. Yeah, of course, or even yeah. Michael Nesmith in the Monkees. Some wonderful country rock songs that you know you can identify as country rock. You know, but I mean, I, I kind of, to be honest, overrated him. And, and 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 I think I underrated at the time, but not anymore. I I didn't realize how important Gene Clark was. You know, Gene Clark, when you look back at his career, due to his alcoholism and due to the fact that poor Gene, whom I knew, I knew Gene pretty damn well, you know, Gene wouldn't fly. Between flying and uh, alcoholism, his career was a piece of shit. Yeah. He should have been, you know, uh, as Eddie Tickner, the Bird's manager, said, Gene Clark should have been a 60s Elvis. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, I, Gene Clark, I should have rated much higher. He, he was fantastic. I mean, his worst LP is worth owning. And, and Chris Hillman, another one, doesn't seem to get the, the recognition he deserves, too. No, and Chris is upset about that. But as his wife said off camera while we were filming Chris, she said, look, honey, you're here, Graham's dead. Who would you rather be, Graham with a credit <laughs> or Chris Hillman? And she's just completely on the... I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with, with Mrs. Hillman, Connie Hillman, more. Yeah, well put. Yeah. You're running your own label these days as, as yeah. well. It was, what are some of the unexpected drawbacks that you've, you've come across there? Well, it takes all my time up. That's a drag. I don't get to write songs like I used to. I was telling this to Peter Case. He's one of my artists. And uh, he was saying, I said, well, the, the thing I've learned is there's an art. There's an A-R-T to doing a record deal or doing this kind of business. But that takes up my creativity. You know, you feel kind of zapped. And you do a lot of that, and you don't feel like, well, I'll write a song now. And he said, yeah, I never looked at it that way. And I said, well, it's true. So while Peter Case, because he doesn't run a record label, gets to still write songs and has time to write songs, I've got to deal with, with uh, pr promotion and publicity and album covers and distribution and, and you know, balancing the books, paying the tax man, paying Her Majesty's Inland Revenue. It just takes a lot out of you. Mm. And then, you know, you don't feel like even practicing. And that's a drag. Now, you mentioned earlier you, you reunited the, the Long Riders for some shows recently. What were your ex expectations going into that? Well, I just wanted, I didn't want the band to be like 90%. I wanted to be as good or better than the old days. And I think in many ways we were uh, as good or better. I noticed that the audience, uh, you know, we used to really exhaust them. Like, we'd, we'd play four songs in a row on this trot without stopping. You know, bam, the song would stop. And Greg would go, one, two, three, and we'd go into the next one. We got that from the Ramones. 
and then we then we stop after like four songs and take a like a uh, and then say hi we're the long riders and everyone would know then it would be on your set list take drink water now or take drink a beer mm -hmm. and then because when we start we do three or four songs again in a row we do them in suites and I noticed we just exhausted the audience because obviously you have the same people coming, right? You don't. You, we had a lot of young guys there that wanted to see what the fuss was about, but mainly it was the old crowd. Like, you know, when the Buzzcocks first reunited, it was the same people that saw them 20 years earlier. Yeah. You know, that's mainly who went to see the Buzzcocks, the same people that saw them in 76, 77, 78. So I, um, I just wanted it to be good. And it was. I've got it on videotape, DVD, and I'm mixing a live album. It was really good. The music was there, and the reviews were amazing. If you go on my website, we got some amazing reviews. Yeah, it's kind of, we, we, I don't remember a bad review, frankly. We got a mediocre one, two mediocre ones, but the rest of them were like just raves. Were you a little two mediocre ones? Were you a little tentative beforehand about whether you'd be able to recapture what you had? I, I knew I would. There was one guy in the band I was worried about. And I won't name which one, but there was one guy in the band that I thought he might be a little shaky. I mean, Steve McCarthy is now the lead guitar player for the Jayhawks. You, you, know, mm. you knew he was going to be there. Yeah. And He's in fine shape. Just before I let you go, see what, what's on the agenda for, for 2005? Well, we're still promoting this bluegrass album by the Cole Porters called How Dark This Earth Will Shine. I wish I had a label for it in Australia, but there you go. And, um, you know, because you can only get in a few copies on import, but whatever. I'm promoting How Dark This Earth Will Shine. I'm going to release the second Sid Solo CD. And um, I might have a radio show on the BBC, because they've offered me uh, a tentative offer. I've, 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 I've had one in the past, which, which was sort of a, a, you know, now you see it, now you don't temporary thing. But they've made a tentative offer of a permanent radio show once a week which I would, you know, late at night, which I would love to do. Love to do. So we'll see. And then we're going to do another TV show, but we're arguing, everyone's arguing about who to do it about. The Graham thing was a roaring success, and it will be on DVD with extra footage later in this year. Oh, that is coming, is it? Yeah, oh, it'll tremendous. be out probably late summer. But the thing is, I want to do maybe the Everly Brothers and the BBC and the German production team are saying maybe uh, Roy Orbison, and so I don't know, we'll see. But um, definitely another TV show, I think, starting in late 2005. This sounds like another busy year. And I'd give anything to play in Australia with the Long Riders, but there you go, whatever. <laughs> we don't have a booking agent down there. Oh, can All I... we need to do is find a booking agent who knows who the Long Riders are. Oh, I'm sure there's some around. I'll try and send you some contacts if you like. Yeah, tell them, tell them that we are available and we would love to do it. And I have a guy that represents me in London. I would kill if we go down and he played just four dates or six dates. I'm sure we could draw a crowd, don't you think? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, we right. did really... We, listen, I'll tell you before you go. We did 17 dates last summer. Two of them were poorly attended, and about 12 were sold out. I mean, we really drew some terrific crowds. We should have done two nights in London and two nights in Glasgow and several other cities, but we just didn't think about it. You know, we had to plan it, like, you know, we started planning in December and started in June. But, I mean... Uh, you know, we really did, did well, and we'd like to do more, so we'll see. Tremendous. We don't want to do the U.K. kind of thing again. We either want to do the continent of Europe, North America, or Japan or Australia. We want to do something different. We don't want to do the U.K. next summer. That's just, you know, we did that. We, we want to do something different. So if you know any promoters, you can give them this number or give them my email. Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll uh, have, a, have a feel around so I can find for you. What's this interview for again? I've already forgotten. Well, Sid, thanks a lot for your time. Really do appreciate you being thanks, so generous John. with your time when you're feeling so lousy. Oh, I feel, yeah, very tired. If you ever have a finished radio show I can hear, I'd love to have a copy. Well, I can do that. No worries at all. When is it going to be broadcast? Uh, ooh, where are we now? Late January. Probably, probably around Easter time, I'd say. Lovely. But, uh, Just keep me posted. I'll tell you what you could do is if you keep us posted, we can put it on the website and I can have people tune in on their computers. Tremendous. Okay. Good on you, Sid. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye, John. Bye-bye.